Act 1, Scene 7. Duncan has just arrived at the castle. Dinner is being served. The stage direction tells us servants are bustling back and forth carrying plates of food. Everyone else is in the dining room with the king, but for some reason Macbeth has left the table. He needed a moment to himself. His mind is racing. Two paths lie before him, a choice between what is right and what he longs for. At this moment of inner turmoil, Macbeth delivers one of the great speeches of the play. We'll go through it in parts. If it were done when it is done, then twere well it were done quickly. If it were done when it is done, twere well it were done quickly. Notice that to this point, Macbeth has not once used the word murder in reference to murdering the king. Lady Macbeth uses the word, but Macbeth, despite the fact that he is considering doing it, cannot bring himself to even say it. The famous first line of this speech is a fantastic use of the technique of euphemism. Part of Macbeth is horrified by the idea of murdering Duncan, and this is shown by the way he cannot even bring himself to use the word. He also wants the act done quickly. If the assassination could trammel up the consequence and catch with her surcease, success. But that this blow might be the be-all and the end-all here, but here, upon this bank and shoal of time, we jump the life to come. Here he uses some difficult words and a complicated metaphor to make actually a very simple point about the murder. Trammel is an old word that originally referred to a certain kind of fishing net. A trammel net has several layers and is used to lure fish in before trapping them at the center, enclosing them on both sides with the mesh. To trammel something, therefore, means not only to catch it, but to wrap it up so that it could never ever leave. So when Macbeth says he wishes the assassination could trammel up the consequence, but keep with its surcease success, what he's really saying is that he wishes the act could have no consequences in this world other than the desired consequence, which is his becoming king. He hopes that this net would bind up all the possible bad consequences and keep them from ever escaping but still catch the one good consequence that he desires. But of course, Macbeth knows this is foolish. Nothing we ever do in life is in a bubble. But in these cases, we still have judgment here. That we but teach bloody instruction, which being taught, returns to plague the inventor. This even-handed justice commends the ingredients of our poisoned chalice to our own lips. All too often, Macbeth knows, the villain's poison ends up poisoning himself. This line about the poisoned chalice may even be a reference to Shakespeare's own earlier play, Hamlet, Prince of Denmark, in which the villain Claudius memorably meets his own end by being forced to drink the poisoned chalice that was meant for Hamlet. More importantly, the poisoned chalice is a biblical allusion to God's wrath, because of the Christian sacrament of communion, we often think of the chalice as a symbol of God's love and self-sacrifice. But in the Old Testament, the chalice is overwhelmingly a reference to God's wrath and judgment. In many places in the Old Testament, God speaks of forcing a rebellious Israel to drink a bitter or poisoned chalice as a symbol of his anger towards them for their sins. Macbeth then describes a whole list of reasons why he should not murder the king. He's here in double trust. First as I am his kinsman and his subject. Strong both against the deed. Then as his host, who should against his murderer shut the door, not bear the knife myself. Besides, this Duncan has borne his faculties so meek, has been so clear in his great office, that his virtues will plead like angels, trumpet-tongued against the d deep damnation of his taking off, and pity, like a naked newborn babe, striding the blast 
or heaven's cherubim, horsed upon the sightless couriers of the air, shall blow the horrid deed in every eye that tears shall drown the wind. Not only is Duncan here as Macbeth's guest, a host being the one who should keep the murderer out, not be the murderer himself, but Duncan also seems to be an incredibly nice person. As we saw in the previous scene, where Duncan naively assumes the kindness and loveliness of the Macbeths, who were only moments before plotting his death, and even in the scene before that, when Duncan appeared so visibly grieved at the betrayal of the former Thane of Cawdor. Duncan, Macbeth thinks, is such a good Christian soul that his murder will scream against the very forces of nature. It will scream like a newborn babe or heaven's cherubim horsed upon the sightless couriers of air. Importantly here, Macbeth picks up on much of the witch's creepy and apocalyptic diction. This sounds almost like an incantation. So Macbeth makes this final comment. I have no spur to prick the sides of my intent, but only vaulting ambition. Following up on that horse imagery from the lines before, he says that he has no spur to prick the sides of my intent. Spurs are the little spikes that riders wear on their heels to urge their horses onwards. Macbeth is simply saying that, having thought it all through, he has no reason left to pursue the murder other than ambition, which he fears will only prove self-destructive. Now presumably wondering why he's been absent from the dinner table so long, Lady Macbeth enters. Hello, what news? He hath almost supped. Why has he left the chamber? Hath he asked for me? <laughs> no, you not, he has. <laughs> we will proceed no further in this business. He hath honoured me of late, and I have bought gold and opinions from all sorts of people, which would be worn now in their newest gloss not cast aside so soon. So Macbeth tells his wife that he has changed his mind. They will proceed no further in this business. This is the introduction to one of the most incredible dialogue scenes ever written, where Lady Macbeth completely shuts down her husband's toing and froing over the murder and convinces him firmly to do it. It is impossible to do justice to this scene by simply analysing it. You must simply experience it in a quality production. But here what we can do is describe two of the key rhetorical devices that Lady Macbeth uses to persuade her husband. First, she associates his reluctance to kill the king with a failure of masculinity. She implies in a wide variety of ways that he is not a proper man if he does not have the spine to murder the king. Was the hope drunk wherein you dressed yourself? Has it slept since? and wakes it now to look so green and pale at what it did so freely. From this time such I account thy love, art thou afeard? To be the same in thine own act and valour as thou art in desire, wouldst thou have that which thou esteemed the ornament of life and live a coward? She ridicules him for his seeming instability of conviction, that one moment he is confident about the murder, but now he's unsure. He has, she says, awoken green and pale. Not only that, but she implies this means he's sexually impotent, and will prove equally inconstant as a lover. From this time, she says, such shall I account thy love. Lady Macbeth bundles sexual prowess, violence, and masculinity all into one, treating them as symbols of each other, in order to humiliate Macbeth, and imply that he is failing to be a proper man across all domains of life if he fails to prove a man in this. Macbeth's response to this is to doubt that masculinity really is purely violence. Pretty peace! I dare do all that may become a man. Who dares do more is none. He points out that, though there is in fact a component of masculinity that involves strength, and sometimes even violence, this does not mean that simply being violent and aggressive makes you a better man. In fact, to do more than the appropriate level of violence that does constitute masculinity is to fail to be a man at all. The second key means by which Lady Macbeth convinces her husband to go through with the murder is through the way she describes her own gender and sexuality. In the first episode of this series, we talked about how the Macbeth's lack of children is a key theme in the play. Shakespeare describes Lady Macbeth as a character who, unable to bear surviving children, feels that she is unable to be a proper woman. 
Deprived of the true feminine ambition, she turns instead to the male ambition of accumulating power. Nowhere is this more evident than in the way she associates her own lack of fertility here with the murder of the king. I have given suck. And know how tender it is to love the babe that milks me. I would, while it was smiling in my face, have plucked my nipple from his boneless gums and dashed the brains out and I so sworn as you have done to this. The Macbeths had a child once, but we can only assume it was weak and sickly and died while still young, as so many did in this time. This clearly remains a deep grief for the two of them as a couple, and to an extent she uses this grief to manipulate Macbeth, making the obviously disturbing and extreme statement that she would have killed that child had she known its husband would prove to be such a coward as to back out of murdering Duncan. But there is more going on in this complex and tragic character than simple manipulation. The idea also draws a symbolic connection between the experience of childhood death and the life of ambition and darkness that Lady Macbeth has now committed herself to. After Macbeth comforts his wife, something not in the stage directions but which nearly all productions share, it seems as if a sort of gender transformation has occurred. Through this metaphorical death of the infant, Lady Macbeth has been born again as a man, and perhaps even Macbeth as the woman obeying her whims. Bring forth men children only, for thy undaunted metal should compose nothing but males. She is so manly, Macbeth tells us, that even if she could give birth, she could surely only ever give birth to male children. Her earlier Unsex Me Now speech in Act 1, Scene 5 has played out now to its fullest logical conclusion, and Macbeth now recognizes her as something more like a man than like a woman every bit as tough and ambitious as he is. After a brief exchange, where Lady Macbeth outlines her plans to drug the king's bodyguards so they can stab them, before leaving the daggers in those bodyguards' arms so as to incriminate them, the scene ends with Macbeth commanding them both to keep a falsely cheerful face in the hours that are to come before Duncan sleeps. I'm settled and bend up each corporal agent to this terrible feet away and mock the time with fairy show false face must hide what the false heart doth know so the two of them return to the dining table to share with duncan what only they know will be his last meal on this earth what was set up from the first lines of the first scene is now at the conclusion of act one set firmly and inevitably in motion the king will die.